We are so glad that you've tuned in today to one of the sermons at Darden Presbyterian Church. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we are excited to walk alongside you as you learn to trust Jesus Christ more and more every day and live into the incredible calling He has on your life. God, as we open up your word to us this morning, may it come alive, may we hear it afresh, and may we leave here changed, knowing more about the incredible love you have for us and the just amazing calling on each of our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So on a September morning in the year 2001, Frank Seleccia laced up his boots, put on his hat, and headed out the door of his New Jersey home. Throughout most of the week, he was a construction worker. But on this day, he was volunteering as a rescuer at the World Trade Center wreckage. As he went, he really tried to make sense of all that he was experiencing. And morning, he hoped to find at least one live body, but he did not. However, amid the carnage, he saw a sign, saw a symbol, a 20-foot-tall steel beam cross. You see, when Tower 1 and Tower 6 collapsed, they created a unique sculpture, and there was a picture of what it looked like the morning of September 11th. No winch hoisted it, no cement secured it. The iron beam stood independent of human help. Several days later, engineers studying the large cross beams recognized that each beam came from a separate building. See, when the towers fell, the two girders bonded into one, forged by fire. And in the midst of the most devastating attack on, in U.S. history, in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the storm, the question was being asked, where is God in the middle of all of this? And the discovery of the cross was a reminder that he was right there in the middle of it all. This morning, we're going to take a look at one story from Jesus' life. And we're going to see for, for ourselves how he might be meeting us throughout our life, especially in our storms. As a church, we are walking through the Bible together, and we're using a book called The Story as Our Guide. Months ago, we started back in the book of Genesis, and we saw that God created the world, the heavens and the earth, and he created man and woman in his image. He created us to be in perfect relationship with him and with one another. But as we've seen time and time again, we as people have chosen to go our own way versus trusting him. And because of God's love for us, because of God's love for his people, he has continually been pursuing us and calling us back to himself. Throughout this journey, we've seen there are really two different perspectives. There's what we see is the upper story, which, where is God's grand plan, his purpose to set things right. And then we've also seen there's this lower story where God's grand plan is lived out in ordinary lives, like people just like you and me. And over the past few weeks, we've seen how the upper story and the lower story collided in the person of Jesus Christ. From his supernatural birth to his first miracle to his profound teachings, we have seen that Jesus is no ordinary man. Jesus' life is chronicled really in four different accounts known as the Gospels. Each of them re uh, reveal a piece of who Jesus is. They give us a window into his power, his purpose, and his self-understanding. Each of them are committed to faithfully reporting what has happened throughout his life. And the story we're going to look at this morning is full of some details. Scholars who study eyewitness accounts know that a writer is conveying truth when it includes these irrelevant details. You see, eyewitnesses record many details simply because they remember them, not because they are important to the story. 
And according to a number of scholars, the story that we are about to read has so many of these details that most believe that the story is authentic, that it can be trusted, and that it is the eyewitness testimony of Jesus' disciple, Peter. Here are some of the details. It says, as Jesus goes out on the lake in a boat, the writer includes details like there are other boats with him. And that Jesus is not just sleeping in the boat, but he's actually on a cushion, and he's located in the stern. These, are, these details are so unnecessary to the story, therefore, pointing back and showing us that this is likely a genuine account. So this morning, let's get into the boat and learn about Jesus' power as he serves alongside his disciples. So Jesus and his disciples had been out teaching during the day, and it says that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were other boats with him, and a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. If you've ever been to this region, known as the, the Sea of Galilee, you would know that it's, it, the, the sea actually sits in what is effectively a horseshoe, surrounded by mountains. And these mountains can rise over 1,300 feet high while the actual sea is below sea level. And, and as a result, this is like a kind of a strange microclimate. It leads to violent storms and turbulent waves. In one moment, the sea can be calm, yet in the next, it can be transformed into a swirling vortex. The Greek word that is used for this storm is actually, it's, it's known as seismic. It's a word associated with earthquakes. This storm had incredible intensity and scared these fishermen who had spent most of their lives out on the water. As the boat was being swamped, the waves were breaking over the sides, but it says that Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? See, the storm was so bad, that these hardy fishermen, who again had spent most of their lives out on this body of water, were terrified. And as a last-ditch effort, seeing the water beginning to spill into their boat, they go to Jesus. Now, as I just read that passage, I don't think that's how they spoke to Jesus. I think it went a little more like this. Hey, Jesus, wake up! Don't you care about us? We're going to die! In each of our lives, we face storms. And these storms threaten to sink our faith. Now, these are not like everyday occurrences, like a flat tire or a hassle at work. These are massive waves. These are howling winds. These are difficulties that cause us to question whether or not God is even good or whether or not God even exists. These are things like a prolonged illness, the death of a loved one, a loss of purpose, a marriage that has been destroyed. These times where we say, if God is even real, is he just asleep? Does he not care about us? See, if he really cared, if he really understood, then surely he would do something. He would keep this from happening. And in those times, we pray for healing and relief. We pray for opportunity. We pray for reconciliation. We just pray that the storm would go away. However, what I see in this story is that the storm is not the point. Yes, the storm is real and it's terrifying. And the disciples themselves do not believe that they will survive. But the point here is not about surviving the storm. The point is about who is in the boat with the disciples. See, the one in the boat is no ordinary man, but God himself. Jesus Christ. 
And it says, for Jesus got up. He rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. I love this. Jesus' response is immediate. It's simple and it's awesome. He doesn't stand up, brace himself, collect his thoughts. He doesn't roll up his sleeves. He doesn't pull out his magic wand. He just speaks and worth a word. And that word is enough. And I love this. Like he speaks to the wind and the waves as if they are listening to him. He speaks to them like you would speak to an unruly child. Quiet. Be still. And the fury of the storm ends. And the water is calm. This was a miracle. But better yet, this was a sign pointing to a much larger truth. You see, Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves as if he was responsible for their actions. Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves as if he was responsible for them. You see, he's not just someone with power, but he has power itself. Just last week, we read about Jesus being at a wedding and being called into action to turn water into wine, showing us that he was the master of the feast. And now in this miracle, Jesus is showing us that he's not just the Lord over the storm, but he is the Lord of all. And no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what's happening in our lives, Jesus provides healing, rest, and power to meet our needs. Mark continues, it says, after Jesus calms the wind and the waves, he said to his disciples, hey, God, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Still after all that you've seen me do, after all that you've heard me teach, you still struggle to believe. She says, at this, the disciples were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Who speaks to the wind and the waves expecting them to respond? Who has the kind of authority and power that they would even listen. For even the wind and the waves obey him. Get this. One moment, the disciples were terrified of the storm. And in the next, they were terrified because he stilled the storm. See, they were unable to answer his question on their own. They had already seen Jesus perform incredible miracles. They had heard demons testify about who Jesus was and be quieted. They knew from Scripture that God alone had the power to control the elements. But now, it had become their personal experience. Before Jesus calms the storm, when the wind and the waves were the most fierce, the disciples yelled to Jesus, Jesus, we are going to die don't you care? And at this, he's aiming right at the heart of the disciples. He's aiming right at our hearts. Man, if you've ever tried to live a life of faith, you know how this feels. Jesus, if you truly loved me, Jesus, if you really cared for us, Jesus, if you, if you have the power do something. Don't let us sink. But notice what Jesus didn't say. He did not say, I understand why you felt that way. He didn't say that. What he says is, why are you so afraid? Or another translation would say, hey guys, where is your faith? See, I love this because Jesus is helping them to see that the critical factor of their faith is not the strength of their faith, but it's the object of their faith. 
See, if they truly understood that God loved them, that they would know that God was not necessarily going to keep them from going through the storm. But because he loves them, and because he's powerful, they did not need to be scared, no matter how bad the storm would get. For he's their God. For he is the Lord, and he is with them. Long before Jesus walked the earth, there was a man who wrote the Psalms. And in the Psalms, we get this, this incredible picture of someone who's walking through both the joys and the challenges of everyday life. And he spoke into an area where he was in the midst of a storm. And here's what he says about God. He says, in the storm, God is our refuge and our strength an ever-present help in trouble. Now, if you went back to the original Hebrew, which this, that this, this psalm was written in, the word ever-present means that God is closer than whatever it is that we are facing. You see, to, to be ever-present means that God stands between us and whatever challenge we face. He stands between us and the storm. And the psalmist goes on, he says, Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Hear that seismic word, right? Even though the, the, the earth is shaken, even though it's chaos, even though our firm footing has been lost, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, no matter how bad things get, no matter how bad things seem, no matter, no matter how out of control the world seems to be, God says to the storm and to us in these moments, these words from Psalm 46. He says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am power and authority. Be still and know that I am the one who steps into the chaos. Be still and know that I am the one who fights the battles. Be still and know that I am the one in whom you can trust. See, I can still your heart. And I can still the storm. In the 11th century, there was a Danish king. And his subjects just were excessively flattering him. And his question to them was, am I God? Am I divine? Am I worthy of this flattery? To prove his point, he went down to the beach, holding up his hands, shouting out at the ocean waves, stop! But they just kept coming. See, what he was showing his people was that only God can stop the sea. I can't because I am not God. However, Jesus is able to exercise the power of God because he is no ordinary man. The scriptures go on to tell us how extraordinary Jesus actually is. They say that Jesus was no ordinary teacher. Mark tells us that when Jesus went out to teach, here's what they would say about him. And they were astonished at his teachings. For he taught them as one who had authority. He taught them as if he was the author who actually penned God's words. He taught them not as the scribes. See, he taught them as one who knew the mind of God and it was commissioned to share it. And because of this, this is why our church is so committed to the Bible as God's word. It's why we take time on Sunday mornings and throughout the week to read God, God's word to us because it is the authority for our lives. The Bible goes on to describe how unique Jesus is in another way. It says that Jesus was no ordinary king. In Paul's letter to the church at a town called Philippi, it says, At that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, because Jesus is no ordinary king, he doesn't rule with an iron fist. 
He doesn't use violence to assume control, but he humbled himself. He sacrificed, sacrificed himself, giving himself over to death on a cross for his people, for you, for me. See, if the sight of Jesus bowing his head into the ultimate storm, giving himself over to death, if that is burned into the core of your being, then you will never say to God, God, don't you care? See, if you know that he did not abandon you in that ultimate storm, what makes you think that he would abandon you in the much smaller storms that you're experiencing right now? So this morning, as we focus on the power and authority of Jesus in the midst of our storms, I want us to reflect on who Jesus is and what he offers See, if you're facing those storms and you are tired of standing on the beach saying stop, if you're in that boat and the water's rushing in and you're not sure what your next step is, here's what the scriptures remind us from the lips of Peter himself. He says, when you're in the midst of your storms, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand, the power of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, that he may lift you up, he may rescue you, casting all your anxieties on him. And why? Because he cares for you. See, if Jesus is with us in our storms, then we can face that call from the doctor. If Jesus is with us in our storms, then we can come home to an empty house. If Jesus is with us in our storms, then we can walk into work on Monday morning or school and we can know that he's going to meet us there. See, if Jesus is with us in our storms, then we can walk confidently into whatever adventure he might lead us into. Before we um, end today, I'm going to show you something that I found very fascinating. Now, many of you will know that is Israel. This is where the people of God were given an area that known as the Promised Land. This is where Jesus did the majority, or excuse me, all of his ministry. It's in a very strategic point throughout world history. In fact, throughout world history, it's been at the epicenter of humankind's most significant events. From wars to historical superpowers to major trade routes. And we've, we've seen this, right? We saw the Assyrians who came from the east, and the Babylonians who came from the east, and the Egyptians from the south. The Greeks will come from the north. The, uh, the, the Romans will come from the west. And even today, they find themselves in the midst of, a, of the current conflict in the Middle East. Now, ancient Israel could have been placed in a much more peaceful location. God could have put them way off in the corner. And they could have flourished. They could have, in a sense, been sheltered from the geopolitical storms that have characterized this region for thousands of years. But here's the deal. Because of where they were located, they were going to have to trust God. And I can just see God saying, right there is where my people need to be so that I can show them and the world that I am bigger than they think. I'm going to put them right there and I have a plan for them. I'm going to walk with them even in the midst of the storms. And this, this got me thinking about our lives. It got me thinking about my life. You know, where does God have me? Where does God have you? Does he have you in a place where you need to rely on him? Where you need to trust him? And if he has you there, what is his purpose? What is his plan? Why are you there? 
for those struggling in their own storm. I want to give you hope that not only will God meet you in your storm, but God will not waste the storm that you are in. Last week we heard about someone who was facing an incredible storm. Someone who found out, Luann, if you were here, she shared a story, a testimony about how she was um, diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer and was told, you have months to live. And through that storm, God gave her an amazing testimony to talk about God's power, his miracle, his sign that he's moving and acting in our midst. And if God leads you through the storm, you will have a testimony of your own. But I also think that when God puts us in a storm and we, we are in the storm, that God will change you through it. See, maybe there are storms that we are currently facing or that we have gone through that immediate relief is not the best thing that can happen to you. Maybe the best thing that can happen to you is that God would do a great work, a miraculous sign in you. See, the storms come. They feed our anxiety. They feed our fear. They feed our hurt. They leave us discouraged. But maybe God is allowing you to go through the storm so by his power, he can begin to transform you making you more fearless, secure, and steadfast in him and his power. Brothers and sisters, you need to hear this. I believe that God can calm the storm in your life. But even if he chooses not to this side of heaven, you can trust that he will uphold you. You can believe that he will transform you. And you can know that he loves you. Why? Because Jesus is no ordinary man. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you meet us in our storms. We thank you that we are not the first to walk through the storms of life, but we see others who have walked through that, Lord, you have been with them. God, we ask that if there's anyone here going through the storm, that they would sense your peace and your presence this morning, that they would trust you and know that you are with them, and in the midst of the storm, that you would work in their lives to, to draw them closer to you, that they would learn to trust you more, and that you would do a miraculous act in their life. God, you are a good God. You have showed us the way. You have showed us what it meant to trust our Heavenly Father, in this morning, may we be people who put our full faith and trust in you, especially in the storms. Amen.